Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, slowly start yes. our conversation. So those who are still outside uh, come in uh, and uh, to volunteers, please close the doors if there is nobody else outside. First, apologies to all of you who are going to miss your lunch, but uh, we promise, together with uh, Ambassador Lajcek, to make these 45 minutes as worthwhile as possible for you. So, uh, let's start. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, welcome to, let's say, my living room already, because it's uh, five years since I've been uh, Secretary General of the Blessed Strategic Forum, so this feels, uh, it's a new experience, but it feels like I'm home. And with me is a good friend, one of the best friends actually of the Bled Strategic Forum, uh, who was here many times. He's also a recipient of the Bled Strategic Forum Distinguished Partner Award and uh, one of the most known European diplomats, Mr. Miroslav Lajcek. Mr. Lajcek, Welcome. If we start uh, with your appointment, let's, you somehow close the circle, at least when it comes to the Western Balkans. You have uh, started, uh, if I'm not mistaken, as a young diplomat in 1999, where you were helping uh, then Slovak Foreign Minister Edward Kukan, uh, who was working in the Balkans, and now, 20 years after, uh, you are returning back to the Balkans in a somewhat uh, different position. How do you feel? I mean, I know you are 20 years older, but is the, is the passion still there to deal with a region as uh, interesting as uh, Western Balkans, where it was, always seems that, you know, they step, the region takes one step forward and then two steps back and the problems from the past are still pretty much the same as they were 20 years ago when you were a much, much younger diplomat. This is about emotions, of course, because this is a very emotional region. So, uh, yes, the, the passion is still there. Uh, you, once you start dealing with the Balkans, I believe there is no escape. Some people say that it starts with an interest that turns into uh, obsession and finally you end up addicted to, to the region. And for these 20 years, I have been dealing with the, with the Balkans one way or another, practically uh, without interruption. So, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, uh, an, a new position, newly created, as you know, as of 2nd of April. Uh, and it's a good decision because uh, uh, it's clear that not everything that is happening in the region is about enlargement and not everybody in the region is part of the formal enlargement or accession process. And therefore, uh, European Union realized that uh, there has to be someone uh, looking after the region 24 seven. And uh, obviously the first task uh, to try to normalize relations between Serbia and Kosovo. So it's, it's a challenge, but I, I really believe that it's a very powerful and very positive signal from the European Union towards the region. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's stay a little bit with uh, this appointment of yours. Uh, there was a lot of talks. Uh, why has uh, High Representative Borrell or European Union and the member states decided to appoint uh, EU special representative? Uh, what kind of signal are we giving to the region? What kind of signal we are giving to our partners like US, but also to third actors who are uh, very much present uh, in the region? What is the signal of European Union? What does it mean? The signal is clearly positive because uh, yeah, the, <clears throat> there has to be someone who uh, the region can uh, talk to uh, or go to at any time. And high representative obviously is the, the foreign policy chief, chief of the European Union, but he has so much on his plate. And uh, the, the Balkans are part of the European story. I mean, they are part of the accession process or wish to become part of the accession process. So they are in different categories. You cannot call them third countries for the European Union. And therefore, uh, on top of it, you, you had the United States appointing even two envoys for the region. Uh, so it, would, it looked quite weird 
if European Union would uh, continue with the business as usual. Plus, uh, the last five years, the previous Commission did not deal uh, with the, the Balkans in a proper way. We all remember the initial st statement of, uh, of the Commission President say, saying there will be no enlargement during the mandate of this Commission. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there were several of, of mistakes being made and the situation in the region did not improve, I mean, to be very diplomatic. So now, uh, it's not only this, the creation of this job, but it's also the statements from Charles Michel, from Ursula von der Leyen, uh, from uh, Joseph Borrell himself, saying that this is the priority for the European Union. Let's, let's not be diplomatic for, for uh, a few minutes. Um, you were talking about the mistakes. Uh, what were the mistakes in the past, in your opinion, uh, regarding uh, the relationship between the European Union uh, and the West Western Balkans? I mean, what could we do better? Because now, with the new European Commission, there is a talk that this is a geostrategic commission. Is Western Balkans as a region part of this geostrategy? Yeah, it, absolutely, yes, because it's not only about the Western Balkans, but it's also about the European Union itself. Uh, so the, the mistake was, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the believing that uh, European Union is us and the Western Balkans is them. And I heard some of the top representatives of the European Union telling their partners from the region, look guys, we are busy with ourselves, we have no time to deal with your problems, but once we fix our problems, then we will be ready to deal with yours. This is totally wrong, because uh, the problems of the region are our problems, and we cannot take the pro-European orientation of the regional governments for granted. And obviously, if there is no, if the European membership perspective gets blurred, then uh, it will have impact on the political situation. And if you, if you speak about energy security for the European Union, or migration, or, or fight against terrorism, I mean, if, if these countries were not with us in our camp, then we have a serious problem. So first of all, it's not us and them. It's not that by, by offering a credible perspective, we are solving their problem. If we are not offering credible perspective, then we are creating a problem for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So major mistake during the previous years was that the, this, we have been moving the goalposts, coming with additional conditions. So enlargement was almost forbidden word in, in Brussels for at least first three years of previous com commission. And you expect them to do European reforms without uh, knowing that there will be a Euro credible European perspective. So all these uh, are mistakes and, and were mistakes. And this has weakened us, the European Union, because then you lose the influence in, the, in your immediate neighborhood. And you, you are saying you want to be a global player. You want to play a role in, in conflicts way outside of, of your region if you are unable to take care of your immediate neighborhood. So it's very much about us, about the European Union. So if we want to be global actor, which I really believe we should be and should want to be, then we have to start uh, demonstrating that we can help organize things in a European way on the European uh, ground, on the, on the European soil. Maybe just a sub question. Um, I mean, this opinion uh, of yours, of course, we share completely in Slovenia and I think Slovakia and also countries who are neighboring the Western Balkans uh, from the EU understand that. How is uh, this opinion shared, do you think, uh, in the more distant capitals of European Union? We have some dissonant voices from some uh, countries who still believe that, you know, we first have to uh, deepen or solve the problems of European Union and then uh, continue with uh, our uh, enlargement process or relations with the Western Balkans. Yeah. Well, it is no secret that there is no enthusiasm for the enlargement in the in a large part of the European Union. Uh, and that's why the European Union made a mistake of uh, basically ignoring the political angle of this process and focusing on uh, technical details. Because the enlargement process is a very unique combination of political and technical uh, aspects and criteria. But it's definitely not only about ticking the box, it's really about politics. And uh, we spoke about this process as, as if it was a te technical exercise and basically pushing the political decisions further and further. Now, it's enlarge, promoting enlargement is not an uh, issue that will win you elections in the European Union, in, in, I would say in the more Western part of the European Union. But, uh, and, and the fact is that part of the responsibility lies also with, with us, with countries who have joined the European Union in 2004 and after, 
I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, yet there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative uh, because, again, there is no vacuum. I mean, if we do not offer a, or if we take away our perspective, then someone will uh, offer a different perspective. And it's also what, I mean, made me upset when, like, at the same time when we were denying European perspective uh, from the region, we were complaining about third actors. I mean, third actor, actors can offer nothing as long as we are offering real perspective. So uh, that's why uh, we have to be, we have to understand that, as I said, we own the process. We should not be a, a afraid of the enlargement process because we have dis defined the criteria. We are the ones assessing the progress. If we uh, don't lie to ourselves, if we don't lie to our partners, then at the end of the process, they must be well prepared to join the club. So we, we, it looks like we, we are scared of our own process. Mm -hmm. but why? But why? <sighs> because of the not so positive experience with some of the new member states after 2004. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, in these more skeptical countries of European Union, uh, enlargement plays a big role in uh, their uh, domestic politics? Because you know some of these countries say that. Uh, they don't support enlargement because the voters don't support that and that uh, you know they can lose uh, elections and so on. Is, is this true? I would say uh, the responsible politicians understand the importance of uh, the continuation of a credible enlargement process. The populists are easily playing on emotions uh, against this. And uh, as we see, the, the wave of populism is present and, it, and, it, and it's growing in many European countries. So uh, that's why, as I said, this is not something that wins in the elections. Uh, it, it helps you uh, to, to score better if you fight against it. But it's totally short-sighted, irresponsible, and in a matter of fact, uh, con counterproductive and dangerous for us, for the European Union, because we really need to have uh, European countries sharing our values, sharing our legal system, sharing our infrastructure. This will make us stronger and not weaker. Let's go uh, now to a different perspective across the Croatian border. What did Western Balkan did wrong in the past? I mean, why is this feeling of, I wouldn't say status quo, but tiredness of enlargement uh, taking place? Because, you know, it's easy just to blame us. Of course, you know, we are the ones, as you said, who geostrategically must find importance in Western Balkans so that Europe is full of, again. But what about the Western Balkans and their political leaders? Do they understand the importance of joining the European Union as soon as possible? People wish to join the European Union, it's clear. Uh, but when I compare the atmosphere in, in the Balkans uh, with the Central European countries, including the two we, we come from, for us there was no alternative, there was no but. For us this was a clear priority and we adjusted every step, every political decision, every piece of legislation that we adopted. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that it gets us closer to the membership. Uh, in the region, as our partners started to believe less in, 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 the, in, in the credibility and in the re reality of the process, they started saying things, but at the same time adopting uh, legislation or signing agree agreements that uh, push them further away rather than closer mm -hmm. to, to the... And this, of course, it's, it's a vicious circle then. This generates a negative atmosphere in the European Union, then there are statements that uh, then are echoed in the region. So this, this vicious circle must, must be really stopped, broken, and we have to get down to business and we have to be serious, both of us. I mean, to, to call the spade a spade, not to pretend that things are good when they are not good, mm -hmm. because we are, not, we are helping no one when we are lying to ourselves. Yeah, that's true. Um, basically, what you were explaining uh, goes down to the lack of trust. There is no trust between the European Union and uh, Western Balkans countries because, as you said, uh, credibility in the past uh, diminished. Um, European Union took a step forward with, you know, proposing and also agreeing upon after many deliberations on the new um, enlargement strategy and also on the new negotiations strategy. Uh, do you think this is a stepping stone in the right direction? Do you think that uh, with this and with our seriousness, we can uh, actually move forward the whole enlargement process uh, quicker than it was in the past? There is clearly a momentum. Uh, 
uh, that came with the arrival of the new uh, European leadership and new commission, new strategic documents. There is no doubt about it because this momentum has also been reflected in uh, the decision to open accession negotiations for North Macedonia and Albania, uh, something that was denied three times before. Uh, we have also, uh, European Union uh, helped the region generously uh, in their fight against COVID. And I spoke, and I'm in touch with all the uh, leaders from the, the region, and I spoke with them about COVID, and they all said, we, de you demonstrated that you are our true friends. No one helped us as, as much as the European Union, and we would not make it without the European Union. Mm -hmm. So you were not the fastest one. There were some who came earlier uh, and tried to steal the show, but now it's very clear that it, no one can compare the assistance. So, but the momentum must not be lost. Uh, we are all f still fighting with COVID, uh, you know, with economic recession that, that stems from it. So we must not, f uh, like, lock ourselves again in some kind of economic nationalism, we must not allow voices saying, no, 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 let's don't talk about the region, let's don't talk about uh, enlargement because we need to, to, to get our economy back in shape. That would be a mistake. I mean, the understanding that it's not us and them, but it's only us is extremely important. Because, you know, as we talked before, fur doctors are not waiting for economy to recover, they're not waiting for a new uh, geostrategic outlook, they're there. Of and they're doing uh, active policy, be it on the economic field, but also on the energy field, and at the end of the day, also security. Of course. How do you assess, uh, for example, you know, the influence of uh, Russia, China, and other, other third actors in the region? I mean, there is no vacuum, there is no void, uh, neither in, in nature, nor in, in, in politics or geopolitics. So if we are not there, somebody else is there. So if we have withdrawn from the space, and then we are complaining that somebody else uh, have filled the space, it, it's hypocritical. Mm. Because, again, we are logically, the European Union is logically the most attractive partner uh, and has the, the best offer for them. And it's not a gift, it's not a humanitarian assistance. We want to help them to, to, to meet the same standards as we have had to, to, to meet so that we are expanding our space. So, I, I'm really I mean, annoyed when I uh, listen to people complaining about third actors. Third actors have nothing, we have nothing to be afraid of third actors as long as we are serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anybody wants to pose some question regarding uh, the relations between the EU and uh, the Western Balkans? Because now we are going to go a little bit deeper into concrete issues where Mr. Lajcek is also an expert. Please, sir. Hello, Matthew Rhodes from the uh, George C. Marshall Center. Uh, this morning, President Vucic uh, referred to the challenges of dealing with two parallel processes of uh, Serbia-Kosovo relations, uh, one run by, by you, uh, Mr. Lajcek, and, and the EU, and one, one run by, by the United States. Um, how much is, do you see this as a challenge in your work, and uh, what more could be done to coordinate the two processes? Thank you very much. Anybody else? If not, uh, please. So we are already in, in the dialogue. Yeah. Actually, uh, we will take this question last because I, we I always... Will, I will answer your questions when we get there. Yeah, okay? because we always uh, leave the easiest answers uh, for the end, you know. Uh, so let's get uh, to a little bit uh, tougher ones first. Um, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I mean, it was, you know, it's a country in a country. It's. Uh, a country who is lagging behind, who is, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, 10 years in the enlargement process after Albania, if we count all the steps that they uh, should make. But it's also a country which is essential for the peace and stability in the Western Balkans. Um, and there is still in the country a Dayton kind of mindset. The politicians, the political leaders, even the people uh, are still living somewhere in the past, probably. How do we, as European Union, how do we move with your experience? You have been EUCR, OHR, you have been, you know, living in uh, Sarajevo. How do we move from this mindset? What should we do so that we 
together, of course, you know, we can do it alone. The local politicians have to take some kind of ownership. But how can we together move this country forward uh, uh, to European uh, enlargement process? You know, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is such a complicated structure that it's very difficult to find partners you can discuss about Bosnia-Herzegovina because unless you have really been there many times or spent part of your life, there is no way you can understand when you read your briefings how complex the country is. So uh, international committee has been heavily present there and therefore <laughs> we should acknowledge uh, our share of responsibility. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean the, the, the current design of Bosnia-Herzegovina obviously is a product of Dayton. Uh, international committee has been present in Bosnia-Herzegovina in a way more massive way than in any other country uh, uh, in, in the region. And uh, what I see as a major problem is that we are trying to fix uh, small problems here and there, but uh, we, as if we do not see or don't understand it, we need to find an answer to a fundamental question. What kind of a state Bosnia-Herzegovina is? Is it a state as shaped in, in, in Dayton, which is a state based on ethnic principle, on, on, the, on, on uh, collective rights, on three constituent peoples who are basically distributing the, the positions among themselves and, and, and the, the, the Ostali? Or we want to see Bosnia-Herzegovina as the rest of European countries uh, based on the civic principle. Uh, and now we, on one hand, we, we European Union, international community, are saying we don't dis disturb Dayton, do respect Dayton, but at the same time, we are pushing, trying to push uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina into our forma formats and formulas, which are anti-Dayton, because they are civic. And uh, why Bosnia-Herzegovina is moving in circles? Because every small issue that they are discussing among themselves, of course, uh, has the answer, I mean, who we are. Are we the, the, the Dayton uh, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina are, or are we a European Bosnia-Herzegovina? And that's why it's so difficult for them to agree on small issues, because once you, you give the answer to who we are, Mm -hmm. Then, and you see that Sarajevo is obviously promoting the civic principle, while, while Banja Luka is fiercely defending uh, the Dayton principle, while being accused of, uh, of uh, attacking uh, or working against the Dayton. Uh, uh, funny enough, Mr. Dodi would like to go to original Dayton, uh, which obviously would make the state dysfunctional. But, uh, so, and, un un until and unless this question, this major fundamental question in answer, mm -hmm. is answered, there will be no... Uh, no, no way forward for Bosnia-Herzegovina because there can be no, and you cannot blame them for that. Because they both, their, their, their vision, and the problem with the international community is that they also, we are also divided. We, we have countries who are clearly siding with the Serbs, siding with the Croats, siding with the Bosniaks. Who is siding with the state, with Bosnia-Herzegovina? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Sejdic Finci, ruling of the, of the European Court, is a, is a classical example of bringing a very standard European principle and trying to impose it uh, in the country which is built on different principles and that's why it, it was impossible to, to, to apply this. So we will have to get serious as an international community. Uh, it's something for uh, the wider international community mm -hmm. to sit down and to basically discuss and we, we must stop fighting among ourselves. We must stop being... Uh, protectors of part of the country, and we will have to sit down and, and, and discuss how to help the country to move forward. Is the EU ready to lead this process? It should be. European Union should be ready to lead this process because uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is a European country. And uh, if there is one issue that enjoys uh, way higher than 50% support of the population, is the European future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, we have 15 minutes left. That's 15 minutes, not enough to discuss uh, the last topic and uh, basically the most prominent feature of the mandate of uh, Miroslav Lajčak. This is the dialogue be between Belgrade and Pristina uh, and the normalization of uh, relations. Um, you just 
the dialogue restarted again, we can, uh, you know, say that this is a success of European Union and uh, of uh, uh, particularly Germany and France and also High Representative Borrell and yourself, obviously. Um, where are we now? You had just recently, I think three days ago, uh, another set of meetings with two negotiators uh, preparing for the meeting uh, of uh, head of states which is going to take place on the 9th of September or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how are the results? I mean, what we were reading in the newspapers, it was uh, quite folkloric from both sides, undermining the other side that, uh, you know, they're undermining the process and that uh, with uh, this kind of people it's impossible to work. How do you see it? Look, the dialogue is currently the most pressing issue, about, or the normalization of relations between Belgrade and Pristina is the most pressing issue in the Balkans nowadays. And both parties understand that. There is no way around the dialogue for them. There is no way around normalization, uh, either on their European path, but also in their normal life. And that's why I'm glad to say that uh, both Pristina and Belgrade understand that well. So uh, at, the, when, at the time when I was appointed, the dialogue was interrupted for 20 months. Uh, what we managed to do uh, since then was to get the dialogue back on track, uh, bring, it, bring it back to Brussels and put the European Union again clearly and firmly into the driver's seat. We had uh, so far two meetings of uh, leaders, one virtual and one physical, and three meetings uh, at the level of chief negotiators. The last one was last Thursday. And in coming days, I would say, uh, we will have one more of each. And uh, I already informed the leaders, President Vucic, Prime Minister Hotti, that we are going to dynamize the process now. We are going to uh, meet way more frequently and they have to get ready to spend way more time in Brussels. Because it is a process. Normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo is not an act. It's a process, a painful process, because if we want to address all the outstanding issues, including those that were already sort of agreed, signed, but not implemented, and this is, of course, our ambition as well, then uh, it is a serious process. And the European Union is a serious player in this process because, first of all, we have been in charge of this process in two, since 2011. Uh, 2010, uh, by the resolution of the UN General Assembly, it was decided that European Union will be driving this process forward or facilitating this process. Why? Because it's clearly linked to the European future of uh, uh, Serbia and Kosovo. So uh, to answer your question, there is only one process which has uh, had its ups and downs, but this is a, a process which is endorsed by the UN General Assembly. And uh, for us, it's about our neighborhood, or, uh, about our future members. And uh, uh, it's, not, it's not about you know, any kind of PR activities for us. We want to, to help uh, normalize relations uh, among partners on the European soil. It's not easy. Obviously, the expectations of two parties are very, uh, very different. But uh, as I said, I, I, I have to really praise uh, my interlocutors for being very serious, uh, being committed uh, to the process, and uh, is working hard. I mean, the atmosphere is not easy, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it would be naive to expect that it would be easy. But it has been always been constructive and uh, uh, respectful towards, it, to, uh, towards each other. Is there a timeline? Is there? There is. You know? There is no timeline uh, because, uh, I mean, I have said it in the past, and I will repeat it. If you set a timeline, then you have already imposed something upon you that will influence your work. We will, we have no reason to drag the process on, uh, but also we, we have to give it as much time as it needs. But as I said, we are going to dynamize the process. We will be seeing our partners in Brussels several times a month, uh, so they understand that we want to, to, to reach the comprehensive agreement as quickly as possible. But why would we impose an artificial end of the process upon ourselves, there is no... And uh, also, to add, uh, we welcome any initiative of anyone as long as it helps mm -hmm. uh, the, our process, the EU-facilitated dialogue. You mean US? Any Initial. third party provided, because, I mean, creating parallel uh, tracks would help no one. 
would help would neither help the European Union nor the United States, and definitely will not help Serbia or Kosovo. So, uh, what is uh, sorry for these quick questions uh, since we are running out of time? What is the leverage? What is the leverage that we can uh, in exert uh, in terms of uh, Serbia, but also in terms of Kosovo? from the side of the EU, European Union so that the process, as you call it, would go quicker and more constructive. Because, as you said, also regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina, we live in many realities. You know, and one of the realities is also that um, just having EU perspective probably is not enough. Well, the leverage is normalization of relations so uh, that uh, the people can live a normal life, uh, that there can be an exchange of people, exchange of goods, uh, a normal existence uh, according to normal European standards. Obviously, it will also uh, bring economic benefits. Uh, but of course, the strongest leverage is the, is the European leverage. That's why the United Nations delegated this process to the European Union. That means uh, uh, their credible participation and successful conclusion of the process should speed up their European integration. But here, and, and this is a, a crucial point, here we come to understanding that there are three partners in the dialogue, not two. It's, it's Belgrade, it's Pristina, and it's us, the European Union. Because we, as I said before, we have something that nobody else has, but we must be able to use it uh, adequately. How is, you, you, how don't, you don't give European membership for free, but at the same time, I mean, denying what we have, uh, means we deny our uniqueness, mm -hmm. then we, any other partner ca can be in charge of this process. If it's about, about paying money, then you don't need the European Union, the, I mean, any, anybody else. But, so therefore, we have to be smart to use our strongest leverage, which is the European perspective, and we have to play, be able to play it wisely. Do you feel uh, you have support from uh, all member states? Do you feel that the European Union is behind you and that you have a robust mandate that you can fulfill and really push forward so that the process goes forward. Because we heard that you know there are some internal discussions among certain member states, they have different opinion how to lead the process. Are you? You know, my previous experience from my uh, missions in the Balkans, either in Montenegro or in Bo Bosnia-Herzegovina, was that you are supposed to take care of these guys, but you also have to watch <laughs> those guys who are, who are there to support you. Or who, uh, which is not always uh, given. But uh, here, uh, in, in this case, I must say that I feel very strong uh, support from, from the, all the member states, and I try, I'm, I try to keep them informed, as, uh, obviously, as much as possible to find the balance between the, the, uh, obviously the nature of the, of the negotiations, but also uh, uh, adequate level of transparency. I've been go uh, going to the Political Security Committee regularly, I have not heard uh, any member state having expressing any reservations uh, for the work we have done so far. Maybe one of the last questions. Um, of course, this is also one of the most interesting topics. Um, what are the red lines in the dialogue? Meaning, do we agree with everything that two sides agree, or do we have some red lines? Of course, here I'm talking about conversation about land swaps, border yeah. corrections, and so on and so on. Uh, we do have red lines. Uh, I don't think it would be correct to say whatever the two parties agree uh, is fine with us. Because uh, uh, as my mandate says, uh, the, the, the end goal that I, I should try to deliver is a comprehensive agreement on normalization of relations that should be in accordance or in compliance with the international law, that should be acceptable to the EU member states, and that should help to promote reconciliation and calm down the situation in the region. So these are my red lines. And uh, uh, certain ideas such as the land swap obviously generated very opposite reaction, particularly in the region. So uh, it, it's very clear that we are not going to promote a solution that will not meet European standards. I, I don't think we should create a different values or different standards for the, re for, for the region. We should promote European way, European solutions. European solutions are not based on redrawing the borders. European solutions are based on promoting uh, European values and supporting uh, those who believe in European values. Okay, now we solved the European Union. Uh, let's move to uh, US and uh, cooperation between uh, EU and US in the process. Uh, 
Uh, on the 4th of September, uh, Mr. Grinnell is going to host a meeting in uh, uh, White House in uh, Washington. What do you expect from the meeting and how do you uh, connect to these initiatives from the U.S.? Do you talk? Have, are you in the constant uh, contact? Of course, there is also Mr. Palmer, who is Special Envoy of uh, State Department for the Western Balkans. Where do you find, I mean, you know, it's a lot of players and you know how they say a lot of cooks, always bad soup. I agree. <laughs> we were not consulted about the date or about the sub substance on, of, of the meeting uh, of the 4th. Uh, we have been informed after the meeting was announced from several uh, US partners uh, about the agenda and they keep uh, saying that uh, the agenda is purely and exclusively economic. So I have no reason not to believe. Uh, I wish we were consulted, I wish we were asked uh, how this meeting could help our effort. I wish we could avoid the impression as if there are uncoordinated uh, uh, processes, but this is not a process, this is an act, obviously a meeting, uh, while we are, we are in a very serious process. I really hope that the outcome of, of the meeting will, will help uh, uh, our process rather than uh, cause damage to it. Thank you, Mr. Lajcek. We have uh, five more minutes for uh, any questions which uh, you have from the audience, just raise your hands. Or you can shout if you don't want to raise your hands. <laughs> don't throw stones, please. Don't throw <laughs> stones. Uh, if there are uh, no more questions, let me see how we are uh, on the digital uh, questions. There is one from uh, Rade, which uh, it's an interesting one. Do you have a plan B if Bulgaria puts vet veto to a start of negotiations with uh, North Macedonia? I don't expect any, any veto from any member state. It's, uh, uh, European Union is too serious to, to allow these this kinds of games and everybody understands how important it is for, for North Macedonia to progress and uh, the outcome of uh, the, the recent elections proved once again that uh, the citizens of North Macedonia believe in, in their European future and we must not betray them. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe last question from me. Magnetic power of the European Union. You know, it was there, as you said, when we were enlarging, you know, we were really acting uh, in consistency with uh, what the European Union and their key were telling us. Uh, this magnetic power in terms of Western Balkans who have this different experience, there was a war, uh, different cultural background also, is not as it was in our enlargement. How do you think, I mean, this is also one part of your mandate, communication strategy between the European Union and the Western Balkans. How do you uh, intend to work uh, in the future in order to, you know, install European Union as the only and the most important choice. Uh, I wouldn't say for the people. The people understand European Union, but maybe more for the political leaders. Look, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, uh, the European Union is strongest when it can lead by example. When we are a model or the role model, others want to be as close as possible or be part of which means we have to function well and we have to, to project agreements rather than disagreements. And uh, the fact is that uh, uh, in these recent difficult times, European Union proved that uh, we can agree on, on the most important issues. And I already mentioned COVID. Uh, and first among ourselves, we started f all protecting ourselves, our own borders, our own citizens. Then we re realized how stupid it was and, and we started cooperating. And now we want EU to have more competencies in the area of healthcare. If we had this discussion before COVID, everyone would be saying no. Now everybody understands that we are all benefiting. Plus the fact that we were generous enough to, to think about the region and that we provided uh, uh, me medical material, uh, medical supply and uh, the financial resources, again shows that we, uh, we see them as our partners. Then the successful outcome of the July uh, European Council the agreement of, of the multi-annual financial framework and also the unprecedented financial package. And again, the region is benefiting from it. So 
tell me who else is uh, producing this uh, positive news uh, which directly and positively affect the, the Western Balkans. So the, the, the answer is simple. Let's just be serious. Let's, uh, let's uh, keep our word, uh, do what we promise, and expect the same from our partners. And uh, I, 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 uh, I, there is no uh, ideal model, but the uh, European Union is, is definitely the, the best of the existing models that uh, uh, we can offer, and uh, I really hope that we will be continue seeing the, the glass uh, half full and not half empty. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Lajcek. Uh, I have to ask you this because uh, it's appropriate that uh, the last question goes from Slovak to Slovak, so from Milanic, which you know <laughs> very good. There is no uh, escape from Milan. <laughs> there is no escape from him, although the, you know, it's uh, not about the, di the dialogue, but uh, do you have any thoughts uh, regarding the regional aspects of the elections in uh, Montenegro. We saw the results. Uh, it's quite an interesting situation. Yes, uh, it is an interesting situation, but it's too early to call. I mean, let's wait until we have the official results and let's, let's wait a couple of days. Uh, it's a good question, but it's uh, too early to enter into, into speculations. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lajcak. I think uh, it was worthwhile for you, and uh, if you hurry up, uh, the lunch is still waiting for you. Uh, thank you again to our guest and dear friend, Mr. Lajcak. And uh, in 15 minutes, there is going to be a new session here uh, on European security. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sitting here on the lunch. <laughs> I hope you will get some lunch. Thank you very much.